Just introducing today Cathy Mills. Much less surprised, kind of, that she's here because she's had a massive week. Um, Cathy was promoted to Associate Professor last week, so the program is now wrong. And, uh, but also, she yesterday won an ARC linkage grant, which uh, for academics is a really big deal. Um, and that is going to be researching engagement in a similar sort of area as her Discovery um, Early Career Researcher Award. So cathy has been doing extremely well in the research area. Um, and I think you'll enjoy this. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I know you've been in here for a long time, and this is getting to the sort of late before the afternoon tea session. So hopefully we'll spice things up and keep you very interested in the session. This is quite bizarre, because I can't even see your faces. It's just a bright, beaming light. So I hope you're smiling, because I am. So I'm Dr. Cathy Mills from QUT, and this over on my right is a panel of fantastic teachers from Himbiumba Indigenous Hub, Listening and Learning Place. And they're going to be talking to you a little bit later um, through a, a bit of a discussion and uh, hopefully give you some enthusiasm, enthusiasm and excitement for the work that they're doing every day in schools. So this presentation is called Valuing Indigenous Heritage Through Multimodal Literacy. So drawing on multimodal texts produced by an Indigenous school community in Australia I apply critical race theory and multimodal analysis to decolonise digital heritage practices for Indigenous students. So I say decolonise because often we think of digital things as being a Western Eurocentric type of activity and what we're doing at the school is using them in innovative ways to help to develop the student's cultural identity. The study focuses on particular ways in which students counter narratives about race were embedded in multimodal and digital design in the development of a digital cultural heritage. And so often in Australia, we don't talk about race, we don't talk about it openly, and that's what this project is about. Pedagogies of teachers that explore counter-narratives of cultural heritage in the official curriculum can encourage students to reframe their own racial identity while challenging dominant white historical narratives of colonial conquest, race and power. And we'll show you how in this presentation. The children's multimodal design, and most of you know what multimodal design is because it's in the curriculum. It's about bringing together images, words, audio, gestures, spatial arrangements in di digital interfaces um, to show how to communicate. So it's bringing those modes together and we do that um, all the time. Um, and the curriculum, it's now a priority in the Australian Curriculum English. So I just want to comment that on the use of uh, the term Indigenous in this presentation refers to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. And I acknowledge that there are many First Nations people, each with their own culture. I need to locate myself as a researcher so it's important to acknowledge up front that I'm not of an Indigenous background, so certain protocols for Indigenous research had to be followed. This included taking sufficient time to get to know the community. I've known the principal of the school, John Davis, who's Indigenous for many years, and we've worked alongside each other. Um, when I was overseas talking about this in the UK, I had people in the audience saying, oh, what's the big deal about a white researcher you know, working with Indigenous people? Um, don't we always have to be, you know, follow certain protocols and be, you know, reciprocal? And I said, yes, but um, when you're working with people who've been historically exploited by white people, um, we have additional concerns to think about and we have to really work on that reciprocity. So we have to make sure that knowledge isn't taken from the community and that's why we've got the panel here today and many of these teachers um, are Indigenous as well. Um, indigenous research involves face-to-face -face work in communities and it's about maintaining long-term relationships. So it's not about going in, collecting some data, 
scooting out, going somewhere else. So I'm spending three years with this school community, getting to know them, yarning, um, working alongside them, and, um, and it's, it's a very uh, community-based approach. This study uh, focuses on the particular ways in which students' counter-narratives about race were embedded in their multimodal and digital design in the development of their digital cultural heritage. I, ref I re use the term critical race theory, which originally emerged as counter-legal scholarship in the USA. Um, it attends to specific needs of cultural groups, um, opposing discourses of positivism and liberal civil rights, um, and is mostly within the law discipline. However, CRT, or critical race theory, has been recently taken up in educational scholarship since the 1990s, and it's been less used in Australia, but it's a very valuable um, paradigm. Critical race theory emphasises that race matters to educational theory and practice, and it continues to be a powerful social construct, an ever-present reality of daily interactions and social configurations. So this research project spans several years across multiple classrooms and hopefully it will lead in from the work we just heard in the previous presentation because we have teachers here from the early childhood right up through the upper primary areas. So we're trying to give you a range of perspectives across the year levels. The work shown here uh, in my PowerPoint is just a sample of the students' digital texts. The ones I want to focus on today are called GAMIs. They're created using the Telegami app and iPads and they're created by year four and five students who, as you know, are ranged between 9.5 and 10 and a half years. These uh, texts were created in Miss Michaela Anderson's class, who's seated here, one of our panel members today. Miss Anderson is an Indigenous teacher and she was in her second year of teaching at the time of the research and her class of 28 students was situated at the school. Um, the integration of Indigenous cultural perspectives, as I said, was part of the curriculum requirements, and so Michaela took that up and worked with me to create these GAMIs. In order to change the way race is understood, race, we believe, needs to be directly addressed in the official curriculum. So what is Telegami? The students first created digital poems as handwritten historical narratives, and Michaela wanted them to write about the first contact between the indigenous people of Australia and the white colonial invaders. She required the students to follow a rhyming pattern of stanzas and include at least eight lines. The children individualised their recordings using the multimodal video features of the iPad Telegami application. So it's like a video tool um, used on the iPad. The template allows the users to create a background using a photo or other image, or they can choose from a number of default backgrounds in the program. To create their GAMI backgrounds, the students innovatively generated this idea of taking photos from the walls of the library. So they saw beautiful Indigenous artworks, and if they resonated with them, they took photos of them and made them in their background. Some of them decided to use the beautiful Australian landscape behind. While the application doesn't provide a wide range of avatar options, the avatar being the person, um, the students could modify some features. For, for example, the gender, the skin colour, the hair colour, uh, the eye colour, clothes, shoes, emotions and facial expressions. The animations of the avatars, so, so the av avatar moves as the kids speak, and you'll see one in a moment. Um, the mouth movements and gestures are automated in the iPad application, and it responds to the emotion that you pick. So if you pick silly, it'll you know, stick its tongue out, or if you pick happy, it'll look happy. Um, and the poems were shortened because they only had a 30 second time limit on the recording of the app. We were using the free version, trying to save money, of course. Um, so today I'm just going to look at three of the narrative poems that were shown from a larger class set. 
um, analysing the, these texts as a site for the students' views of Indigenous oppression in relation to the colonial powers and ownership of land in Australian history. Um, my analysis focused on multimodal aspects of the students' gamis following semiotic um, categories theorised by Jewett. Some of you may be aware of Jewett's work in the UK. This involves things like visual design, movement, gestures, gaze, recorded speech, and how they work together. The content of the stories directly address these historical issues of Indigenous and white racial relations. Now, one of the key themes that emerged in our analysis of the Gami videos was the potential for multimodal design in remaking a decolonised collective social memory. So bringing them together to think about things in the past that have affected them as a race. And you can see in the background of that Gami there, um, there's actually um, a little, um, little structure that the kids made in another part of the curriculum and one of the students decided to do her Gami with that behind because she thought it would be a nice background. So they made connections to different subject areas. They made connections to their collective past in relation to the first contact. Their previously unarticulated views of this historical moment were imagined in ways that contain both similarities and divergences to one another in a shared practice of social memory. Um, and I'd like to show you now a video called The White Fence, which is by one of the children. Today I went down to the lake to catch something to bake. I took it home to bake for the family at home and we ate, but I got caught for entering the land. I had jumped over the white fence and now things are tense. Isn't that beautiful? So we've called that one the white fence. So here the student uses an indigenous painting as the background visuals depicting the official Torres Strait Islander flag on the left and the Aboriginal flag on the right. The green strip above and below the blue of the Torres Strait Islander flag symbolises the land and the red of the Aboriginal flag represents the Australian earth, red ochre and their spiritual relation to the land. And when I talked to the girl about her gami, she could articulate all of that. The, word, the creation of the gami is about the first contact between Indigenous and white races provided these kids with an opportunity to explore the history of the land from a non-European point of view. Think about jumping the white fence, referred to in line four. It's a physical barrier in the story, but it could also symbolise the ongoing history of jumping white fences that's characterised much of the history of Indigenous people. The sharing of these multimodal texts contributes to an ongoing reformulation and remembrance of Indigenous history, its implications for understanding the hegemonic relations that persist in the present, using a new mode for the interchange of ideas and cultural values. I'll show you another one created by one of the boys. I went down to the lake one day to catch the fish in the bay. I saw a fence, I jumped over it, a white man shot me a little bit. I ran back home, got a fish. It wobbled on the dish, but we came here all the time. Since when has this been a crime? So in this gami, the boy selected the emotion of angry to communicate his message. Since when has this, using our own land, been a crime? This is indicated in the postural stance, hands on hips, of the avatar. In the painting photographed in the background, indigenous footprints are seen to end at the dog tag, and the footprints become the shoe prints of European colonisation toward housing developments and networks of roads. Barbed wire is sim symbolic of the Aboriginal settlements, the reserves where indigenous people were sometimes sent as a punishment and forcibly removed from their homes. Cultivating these counter-narratives allow the students to assert imagined social identities that sometimes are absent in official curricula. Similarly, the sharing of cultural counter-narratives can help build a community among those who are marginalised by society. Digital heritage practices can challenge the assumptions, values and prejudices that undergird dominant narratives by providing personal examples or imagined identities that contradict dominant narratives. I've often 
uh, looked at the term, you know, and people say, well, what about culture, you know, culture today? It's just neutral. Well, it's not. There is a culture, and if there's a white culture and you're positioned marginally to it, it makes life very difficult in many ways, in ways that a lot of people don't stop to analyse and uh, look at. So let's have a look now at the next video called The White Kangaroo. I went to the lake one day. Me and my cousin went to play. And we found a kangaroo. A kind of white kangaroo. I saw a white man on my people's land. I said, stay off my land. He said, this is my land, not your land. I really love that one. Um, the student could tell me all about the uh, symbolism in the background in the paintings. And um, we see that the painting of the tribe and the land provides a visible scene for the verbiage of the narrative at the lake. So she wanted it to be a sort of bush scene that fitted in. Um, and she also knew about the spirits and the different sizes and what the different patterns meant. The reference to the white kangaroo, I think, is very significant. It anticipates the curious arrival of the white man while perhaps signifying the important connections between land, animals and the tribe. Phrases such as my people's land emphasises the collective nature of the indigenous custodianship of the land using the possessive pronoun my. The gestures, which were automated by the application, appropriately match the tone in the narrator's voice. Her arms encircle the body to form a physical barricade which accompanies the final words of the white man, this is my land, not your land. This line is interesting because it interrupts the pattern of stanzas. So she was in a rhyme before and this one goes off the rhyme. And I think that this adds impact. The Gami enables viewers to feel the rupturing of traditional land ownership and the geographically placed meanings. The digital storytelling activities were not just schoolwork. They were deeply connected to the student's life experiences. For example, in this Gami, the student chose to use a painting in the library as her background that resonated with her own family's stories. Carla said, my favourite, my most important story is when my nana was taken away when she was little. My favourite part of this was just thinking about nana. When interviewed, she diverged from my Western or Eurocentric interview script and began singing Indigenous songs to express her voice. What's the significance of this? Well, the studies demonstrated how Indigenous Australian teachers provided a space through digital and multimodal design for young colonised people to be listened to and their ideas known. The educational and cultural implications of bringing students together to share digitally and multimodally um, constructed practices of remembrance at school has previously received little attention in research, including the design of literacy activities to these ends. The students re-narrated their indigenous cultural heritage and tensions over land ownership to understand the historical present. In the words of one student, now things are tense. This study demonstrates that creating digital counter narratives can enhance a student's understanding of their identities that are multifaceted and often contradictory among indigenous groups. Such narratives are needed to, as uh, said, um, cited, universalizing discourses of modern Europe that assume the silence, willing or otherwise, of the non-European world. We need to counter this. White culture is not neutral. So to conclude, I'd like to show you a recent video created by Jane Dooley's class her class of year five and six students with graphic designer Josh Dara only just a week or so ago.
Thank you. Okay, so over to the school panel. So we're going to look at the question, how can teachers engage students in Indigenous knowledge in inspiring ways? So could we hear from the panel, anyone who'd like to answer that question? Oh, actually, I should introduce them all, sorry. <laughs> Jessica, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, my name's Jessica Endin. Um, I am a Waka Waka woman from the South Burnett. I am currently teaching year one. I'm also the early years coordinator, so from the creche to grade three. Um, and this will be my fourth year at Kimbiyumba. Okay, so moving up to the microphone, Ali. Hi everyone, I'm Ali Barty. I'm a Narragoo woman from the tribe in Northern Victoria. Um, I'm a graduate, so just graduated last year. My first year teaching year two this year, and yeah. And Jane? I'm Jane Dooley. I'm a Kamilaroi woman from Gunnedah in New South Wales, and I'm also a graduate teacher, so we're exactly the same age. <laughs> <laughs> and Michaela. Um, my name is Michaela Anderson, and I'm a Gungaloo woman um, from Central Queensland. Um, our totem is the Emu, and I'm in my third year teaching and three years at Kim Dumba. Excellent. So, looking at the first question, um, Jess, would you like to comment on how do you engage your students in Indigenous knowledge in inspiring ways? Um, I like to follow my children's interests um, and then also in incorporate to the best of my abilities, their families and their home lives and traditions. Um, so for an example, uh, we have an auntie who comes into our classroom every Thursday, um, but I've also had past experiences with families, um, members coming in and sharing stories and kind of using the curriculum as a basis, but also incorporating their children's previous knowledges um, and their culture into my planning. Who else would like to come in? Um, I personally think that making sure you connect really strongly with the Jajis and what they know, if you actually give them the time to speak, they know a lot more than you think they do. Like, I've got year two, and they have taught me so much about Indigenous culture that I didn't even know. So giving them that time to sort of expand on what they know from their knowledge and experience, I think, is really important. Um, sorry, I'm going to put up to um, Especially at Himbiamba, we, we're very focused um, around the family, um, and the community, so incorporating the community and family into the class um, through curriculum, but also through celebrations that we do. So that's a big thing at Himbiyumba is, is that family and um, community. I think we're lucky that we teach in a, a Himbiyumba is a really special space that allows kids to make cultural connections in just about everything they do. And the project, that the little film project that my kids were involved in, we were able to connect to lots of um, inspiring teachings. So we've got an art specialist that comes in and while he's teaching the kids uh, culturally relevant drawings and, and artwork, he's storytelling and the kid, it's a light, fantastic, engaging lesson. And I was able to use that connection in the project I did. We use, we've got a fantastic music teacher who teaches music our way. And those lessons are very culturally relevant to our kids and they're, they're very engaging and connected. So to be able to bring those two inspiring teachings into our literacy work is, is just an amazing special um, gift that we've got because we teach at a special place like in Biyamba. That, that video was so beautiful, just watching the kids in class as they prepared that video. They were just mm. so engaged and the smiles on their faces and it just almost brings tears to your eyes when you watch it, when you know the kids as well. Um, yeah. So looking at the second question, um, what aspects of Indigenous knowledge are caught rather than just taught? I'm thinking here, like when I first came to the school, I was just surprised at how many different things that you do that really reinstate that cultural identity. And they're not just, you know, now we're doing a unit on Indigenous knowledge. It's, it's every day, it's moment by moment, it's how you do things. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, in my class um, on the Monday mornings, we'll often do acknowledgement. So um, each child gets a turn um, weekly to perform that. And 
Also, um, the other cultural processes that we follow, things like yarning circles within all our classes, and even in our um, assembly, which is called Binda. Um, and um, I guess we link those through our storytelling, and, um, and we have our languages really strong at the school, so we're not just learning um, you know, a very broad sort of language, we're actually learning the other language there too, so it's really connected and really strong. Um, my input on this would be that we're talking about engaging Indigenous kids um, and culturally Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are lifelong learners. So it is disengagement from that learning process isn't about it being Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. It is about addressing, as Cathy was talking about earlier, that a disconnection from culture. So um, in introducing those aspects of, of culture gives them that sense of identity and pride. And when um, this gentleman down here asked about the adolescents, our space is special because we have these amazing, incredible um, Indigenous people that are teachers and IEWs and the, the cleaners and the library and the elders that come and engage with our kids. They're presenting these wonderful cultural role models for our kids. So if you've read the um, Embedding Indigenous Perspectives document, it talks about creating a, a cultural space for into our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids and I would suggest that creating a space where their elders and their families and their um, are welcome and their, where their culture is relevant and accepted is part of that step forward into what you're talking about and it brings in the Indigenous knowledges that you're talking about. We are by nature and culture lifelong learners so I think that's what we need to remember. Um, I also think that having the consistency of these ways of working is really important so we don't just do yarning circles every now and then, we do them every day. Same with the acknowledgement that Michaela was talking about. It's every morning, it's in every process that we do. So we'll come into class, we'll do the acknowledgement, we'll sit in the yarning circle. Lessons are generally taught in yarning circles so everyone's facing and everyone can see. And just having that consistency is something that the judges really enjoy. Can you just explain what the yarning circle is in case some of them aren't familiar with it? Yeah, so a yarning circle is where everyone sits in one big loop circle, so everyone's facing in, everyone has the same respect. There's no leader in the circle, everyone's got the same amount of right to speak, um, yeah, empower everything. It's very open, it's very willing to let everyone learn sort of thing. It's not just run by the teacher, it's more so run by the whole group. And it's interesting, the spatial configuration of a circle, you know, that, that sense of community in that group. You know, here, for example, in the room, we've got a bunch, a square of people here and a square here, you know, in rows. And, you know, so it's that, that circle's a real sense of community where they, where an open space where they can all contribute equally. Mm -hmm. I would just touch on also in our senior school, we have bungee and tier time for our male and female um, high school students. and. They take their own ownerships of running their own program. So we have our high school leaders who take the um, ownership um, of what they want to talk about their learning as well as have our IEW, so Indigenous education workers who have strong connections to our community um, and the Jajis themselves. Mm. Now, I'm gonna ask one more question and then after that, I'm gonna open the floor to you to ask questions. So I'd like you to jot down any ideas that you get um, as you think through this next, as they're talking, so that we can move smoothly into the question time. So how can teachers make connections with Indigenous knowledge in literacy learning in particular? Um, I think personally is understanding how our people thousands of years ago have learnt, and that was through music and stories and art and dance. So that's, you know, they're the obvious things that you can start with and, and begin with, but um, obviously through other projects that I've done with Kath is it can be expanded and um, and you'll get some really great stuff out of the kids because as um, Ali said before you know they're teaching you as well so those are a couple of things. Um, I would suggest that what you're trying to do I guess what we try what we do is is different because like I said before we work in a really special space but what you're trying to do is make those connections those, in, those connections to, to Indigenous kids in your classrooms. And I would suggest that what you're 
the most benefit your kids would probably get is by making enduring connections with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So if we take away the mystery of culture and the, um, the, the stress of knowing what the right thing to say and what the wrong thing to say is and just talk about how we connect to each other and, and make enduring connections. And as far as literacy learning goes, how beautiful is storytelling? How, um, how, how much connection and, and intimacy can you get from an elder visiting you and, and engaging with her stories or his stories? Yeah, I think knowing that you can alter the curriculum where you need to, you don't have to stick to the books that the curriculum says. You can incorporate Indigenous books, you can incorporate Indigenous knowledges and ways of working. Um, you can use the language that the judges are used to using. So in the morning, saying Garumba Biggie instead of good morning. You can incorporate that if they want to use that in their assignments and that's fine. Also looking into the student's ability. So if you've got someone that's a really great dancer, maybe assessing them on dancing. So for example, storytelling, you can assess them through dancing, through pictures, through writing, whatever their strongest abilities are, whatever they're comfortable and working with, you can alter the curriculum to make it suit them. Um, just getting out there in your local community, attending the events that are held annually, checking in, seeing if you can find local elders who are willing to come into your school but not expecting it at the same time. Um, and just, yeah, oral language is very precious so it can be used in many, many different ways. Mm, thank you, that was excellent. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Okay, so we have nine minutes left for some questions. Um, so if we could have these um, microphones going through the audience. If you've got your questions, put your hands up nice and high so we can see you. Don't be shy. Up, oh, there's a hand up the three quarters of the way up in the middle row. Cut. Uh, hi guys, I just had a question about um, whether, it's, what, what you guys do sounds really incredible at the school. Um, are there any opportunities um, for students to kind of go out and show people within the community, not necessarily in the Aboriginal community, but like in the wider community, to show people what you guys do as part of the Aboriginal culture? So are you talking about you, what you can use in your classroom? Is that connecting it to your classroom? Is that what you're talking about? Um, well, a sort of um, like a showcase of what your students produce, um, you know, as, as an exemplar for other schools, mm. like your students going into other schools to perform or... Do you want know. to tell them about the, um, the special thing that you ran where everyone came to the school with the Absolutely. lovely food and everything cooked in the ground? Mm. Last year we ha um, hosted our first symposium mm. where we invited... Um, teachers from local schools. Um, it was through ISQ, Independent Schools Queensland, um, and Michaela and I kind of displayed our work, um, as well as Bree, who's our high, one of our high school teachers, and John spoke about how we kind of, the ways of working in our school, as well as our language teacher. So I suppose we more or less invite people to come in, into our school, whereas go out and um, kind of put our children on display. Um, we don't kind of like to say that they perform, but I suppose just acknowledge their work. We've also um, had some work displayed at the State Library as well um, towards the end of last year. Some of our seniors' um, work was in the State Library and um, we welcome any visitors to our school as well. So, but no, we don't generally go out and display our children as such. When they had a special um, event at their school, they had about 70 teachers from South East Queensland come along and one of the beautiful things about it was we went down into the bushland and the boys had the yellow ochre and they put the marks on our skin on every single person there. And it just it was a really embodied feeling, like we were all connected to each other. And then when we left, we had to wash the yellow ochre to the ground from which it came. And it was just a really beautiful symbolic way of sort of bringing us all together and, and just getting a, a real sense of, of the history of, the, of that place and, and what's going on there today. Um, one of the other things um, is a book that the, the school has produced and is that available for sale as well? Mm -hmm. So they've got this beautiful book which has got little profiles and pictures of all the kids and their stories um, and obviously compiled by the children with um, the teachers and so on and it's a 
beautifully illustrated, high quality book, and that's another way of, of supporting the school, but also knowing, understanding what's going on at the school. Um, and as well, that presentation they did at the State Library, they had um, Indigenous dancers and so on. Um, so they regularly look for those sort of forums where um, the students can impact the broader community. So we have some other questions. I've got two questions. One's a very small one. Did I miss what a Jaji was? Oh, it's a young person, a child. Oh, thank you. And my second question was, when you were talking before about making connections with Indigenous knowledge in literacy learning, you gave some examples, but I'm wondering if you could go into one of those a bit more specifically. You talked about having different people in from the community, but what then do you do? What's your next step? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so last, oh, it's the year before last, I conducted a dreaming unit, which actually stemmed from show and share of a child um, just displaying a traditional costume that he wore um, when he danced in Sydney, and it was made from kangaroo fur. And it kind of started kind of a heated discussion on what that animal, uh, who that animal belonged to, and then we started to talk about totems. From totems, um, I then kind of linked to each child's totem to a dreaming story with the help of an elder as well as uh, their families. We also had that child's mother come in and discuss exactly what happened to that animal um, and that every part of the animal was used. Um, so then it's a matter of also, if we kind of backtrack, you look at the co cultural protocols, I had to ask permission um, to conduct that unit. I had to ensure that I was culturally competent and make sure that I involved elders because it was definitely out of my expertise. Um, and just, I suppose, making sure that the children's interest was continually fo uh, followed through on. Um, but the unit came definitely from the children. Um, and then we were able to link that to literacy skills and developed um, kind of scrapbook type stories with a, a smile, box. smile box, thank you, with smile box, um, which linked to uh, unit seven for C to C as well. So um, creating in a, uh, innovations. So linking to the curriculum, using children's knowledges, mixing it all together and you get beautiful child focus lessons and units of work. Some of the stories from the unit were really exciting. So the, the elder came in on his wheelchair and the kids were all surrounding him and he, would, he could know from their surnames which region they were from and then he knew which totem was associated with the region if the kids weren't sure. Um, and then the children chose um, Dreamtime stories that related to that totem. So each child had a different story, and it was just beautiful um, the way the whole unit sort of ran together. So we've only got two minutes, so I think that's probably time for closing. So thank you to the panel, and thank you all for being great listeners this afternoon.